The Knight's Tale, Part 1 Stories of old have made it known to us that there was once a duke called Theseus, ruler of Athens, lord and governor, and in his time so great a conqueror, there was none mightier beneath the sun, and many a rich country he had won. What with his wisdom and his troops of horse, he had subdued the Amazons by force, and all their realm, once known as Scythia, but then called Themini, Hippolyta, their queen, he took to wife, and, says the story, he brought her home in solemn pomp and glory, also her younger sister Emily, and thus victorious, and with minstrel and with minstrelacy. I leave this noble duke of Athens bound, with all his host of men-at-arms around. And were it not too long to tell again, I would have fully pictured the campaign in which his men-at-arms and he had won those territories from the Amazon, and the great battle that was given them between those women and the Athenian men, or told you of how Hippolyta had been besieged and taken, fair courteous queen, and what a feast there was when they were married, and of the violence of the storm that harried their homecoming. I pass these over now, having, God knows, a larger field to plough. Weak are my oxen for such mighty stuff. What I tell you, what I have yet to tell, is long enough. I won't delay the others of our route. Let every fellow tell his tale about, and see who wins the supper at the inn. Where I left off, let me again begin. This duke I mentioned, arrow lighting down, and on the very outskirts of the town, in all felicity and height of pride, became aware, casting an eye aside, that kneeling on the highway, two by two, a company of ladies were in view, all clothed in black, each pair in proper station, behind the other, and such lamentation and cries they uttered, it was past conceiving, the world has ever known, the world had ever heard, such noise of grieving, nor did they hold their misery in check till they grasped the bridle at his horse's neck. Why may you, why may you be that at my coming so perturb my festival with cries of woe, said Theseus? Do you grudge the celebration of these my honors with your lamentation? Who can have injured you, or who offended? And tell me if that matters, maybe and tell me if the matter may be mended, and why it is that you are clothed in black. The eldest of these ladies answered back, fainting a little in such deadly fashion, that but to see and hear her stirred compassion, and said, O oh, sir, whom fortune has made glorious in conquest, and is sending home victorious, we do not grudge your glory in our grief, but rather beg you mercy and relief, have pity on our sorrowful distress, some drop of pity in your nobleness. On us unhappy women let there fall, for sure there is not one among us all that was not once a duchess or a queen, though wretches now, as may be truly seen. Thanks be to fortune and her treacherous wheel that suffers no estate on earth to feel secure a moment, be assured that we, here at the shrine of goddess Clemency, have watched a fortnight for this very hour. Help us, my lord, it lies within your power. I, wretched queen, that weep aloud my woe, was wife to King Capanius long ago, that died at Thebes, accursed be the day, and we, in our disconsolate array, that make this sorrowful appeal to pity, lost each her husband in that fatal city during the siege for so it came to pass that old, now old king creon oh alas alas the lord of thieves grown cruel in his age and filled with foul iniquity and rage for tyranny and spite as i have said does outrage the bodies of our dead on all our households, and when they were killed, their bodies were dragged out, so Creon willed, into a heap, and there, as we have learnt, they neither may have burial nor be burnt, but he makes dogs devour them in scorn. And at that, they all at once began to mourn, and every woman fell upon her face and cried, Have pity, Lord, in our disgrace, and let our sorrow sink into your heart. The Duke 
who felt a pang of pity start at what they spoke dismounted from his steed he felt his heart about to break indeed seeing how piteous and disconsolate they were that once had been of high estate he raised them in his arms and sought to fill their hearts with comfort and with kind good will and swore on oath that he was true knight so far as it should lie within his might he would take vengeance on this tyrant king this creon till the land of greece should ring with how he had encountered him and served the monster with the death he had deserved instantly then and with no more delay he turned and with his banners in display made off for thebes with all his host beside for not a step to athens would he ride nor take his ease so much as half a day but marched into the night upon his way but yet he sent hippolyta but yet he sent hippolyta the queen and emily her sister the serene on to athens where they were to dwell and off he rode there is no more to tell the figure of red mars with spear and targe so shone upon his banners white and large that all the meadows glittered up and down and close by them his pen his pennon of renown shone rich with gold emblazoned with that feat his slaying of the minotaur in crete thus rode this duke thus rode this conqueror and led his flower of chivalry into war until he came to thebes to thebes there to alight in splendor on a clean field to fight and to speak briefly of so great a thing he conquered creon there the thebian king and slew him manfully as become a knight in open battle put his troops to fight and by assault captured the city after and rent it roof and wall and spar and rafter and to the ladies he restored again the bones belonging to their husbands slain to do as custom was their obsequies but it were all too long to speak of these or of the clamorous complaint and yearning these ladies uttered at the place of burning the bodies or of all the courtesy that theseus noble in his victory showed to the ladies when they went their way i would be brief in what i have to say now when duke theseus worthily had done justice on creon and when thebes was won that night camped in a field he took his rest having disposed the land as he thought best crawling for ransack among heaps of slain and stripping their accoutrements for for gain the pillagers went busily about after the battle on the field of rout and so befell among the heaps they found thrust with the bloody wounds upon the ground two pale young knights there lying side by side wearing the self-same arms blazoned in blazoned pride of these Arcatia was the name of one and the other knight was that of the other knight was palamon and they were neither fully quick nor dead by coat of arms and crest upon head the heralds knew for all the filth and mud that they were princes of royal blood two sisters of the house of thebes had bore them and out out of the heap of these pillagers out of the heap these pillagers had torn them and gently carried them to theseus's tent and he decreed they should at once be sent to athens and gave order they be kept perpetual prisoners he would accept no ransom for them this was done and then the noble duke turned homeward with his men crowned with the laurel of victory and there was and there in honor and felicity he lived his life what more is there to say and in a tower in grief and anguish lay archite and palamon beyond all doubt forever for no gold could buy them out year after year went by day after day until one morning in the month of may young emily that fairer of the that fairer was of mien than is a lily on its stalk of green and fresher in her coloring that strove with early roses in maytime grove i know not which was fairer of the two ere it was day as she was wont to do rose and arrayed her beauty as was right 
for May will have no sluggardy at night, season that pricks in every gentle heart, awakening from sleep and bids it start, saying, Arise, do thine observance do. And this made Emily recall anew the honor due in May as she arose, her beauties freshly clad to speak of those, her yellow hair was braided in a tress, behind her back a yard in length, I guess, and in the garden, at the sun's uprising, hither and thither at her own devising, she wandered, gathering flowers white and red, to make a subtle garland for her head, and like an angel sang a heavenly song. The great grim tower keep, so thick and strong, principal dungeon at the castle's core, where the two knights of whom I spoke before and shall again were shut, if you recall, was close adjoining to the garden wall where Emily chose her pleasures and adornings. Bright was the sun this loveliest of mornings, and the sad prisoner Palamon had risen with license from the jailer of the prison, as was his wont, and roamed a chamber high above the city whence he could descry the noble buildings and the branching green where Emily, the radiant and serene, went pausing in her walk and roaming on. This sorrowful prisoner, this Palamon, was pacing round his chamber to and fro, lamenting to himself in all his woe. Alas, he said, that I was ever born, and it so happened on this May day morn, though through a deep window set with many bars, of mighty iron squared with massive spars, he chanced on Emily to cast his eye, and as he did, he blenched and gave a cry, as though he had been stabbed and in the heart, and at the cry. Arxita gave a start, and said, My cousin Palamon, what ails you? How deadly pale you look! Your color fails you! Why did you cry? Who can have given offense? For God's love, take things patiently, have sense, think! We are prisoners, and shall always be. Fortune has given us this adversity. Some wicked planetary dispensation, some Saturn's trick or evil constellation, has given us this, and heaven, though we had sworn this contrary, so stood when we were born. We must endure it. That's the long and the short. And that is where we will stop.